Hey everyone, I'm here with Tim Sorens. Uh, Tim is co-founding executive director of the Parish Collective and the author of Everywhere You Look, Discovering the Church Right Where You Are. Hi Tim, how you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to be here, Marcus. Yeah, I'm so glad to uh, have this conversation with you today about about the church in the neighborhood. I think, at least, I think that's that's where we might be going with this. Um, I'm excited. Tell tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, I am, as mentioned, I'm the co-founding executive director of the Parish Collective, which is a network of place based churches and community groups all over the country, um, even beyond the United States, and our mission is simply to connect people to be the church in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And our hunch is that if we could do that, if we could do that connecting work of people that are following Jesus in the neighborhood to be the church, there is almost nothing that couldn't be renewed and restored and reclaimed and honestly reimagined in our time of, you know, incredible polarization and pain. So we're, we're effectively a, a network that's trying to identify and connect people to be the church. That's awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, and we'll hear probably a little bit more about what you're doing uh, as we have this conversation. But I want to ask you one little get to know you question, and that is, uh, what is your favorite smell? Ooh, favorite smell. <laughs> hmm. Well, I would say my favorite smell, I think, would be the salt water of the ocean. My nice. Smell. Nice. I grew up in Wisconsin, mm-hmm. which is very far from any ocean. And when I was like 11 years old mm-hmm. for three months, mm-hmm. um, my dad took us, the whole family to live in Southern California. Yeah. And I fell in love with the ocean oh. then and ever since. That's yeah. great. That's great. Remind me, where do you live now? Now I live in Chicago. Chicago. Okay. Kind of far yeah. from the ocean. <laughs> also pretty far from the ocean. Yeah. Oh. You know, it's it's cool that you say that because actually um, la- oh, yesterday or the day before, as I was kind of thinking about what continue question to ask, I had to reflect for myself. What would I say? And I was thinking about some things and um, I was like, you know what? It's salt water of the ocean that's what i love I, i'm in really? san diego and so i get to get that no for reals that's exactly what i thought so to hear you say that i'm like oh <laughs> yeah. a brother that's from another mother <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, yeah 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 that's awesome um well cool well let's talk about uh let's talk about church neighborhood all that i would love to hear your story um because you were planning to be i believe like a traditional sort of pastor uh, in a traditional context and that changed tell tell us well you're you can t- talk about your faith story and maybe what led to that as well as then what led you to what you're doing now sure well i'm i grew up i grew up in wisconsin and grew up in a lovely um relatively religious home but for most of high school and college and some of this i think is some of the underpinnings of how I was either taught or maybe just how I understood what the gospel was about. It, it felt small, to mm-hmm. be honest. It felt just about a, a different life, like far away. It, it had not a lot to do with my life mm-hmm. here and now. And it, and it didn't feel like a very big story to live into. Mm. And that changed um, through a whole series of circumstances and mm-hmm. Um, relationships and mentors and, you know, obviously lots of readings where, you know, initially for me, it was this idea of grace that everything is Mm -hmm. gift and that felt revolutionary to me. And Mm -hmm. then that took me down the path of um, reconsidering what Jesus was talking about when talking about the kingdom of God. Yeah. And then that took me into the unbelievably powerful idea of what the local church is and can be mm, yeah. how beautiful it is. Yeah. And so, um, I went to seminary at the prodding of a mentor kind of a little bit reluctantly kind of like, mm, this is not my life's goal is to be a pastor. Um, uh-huh. but I, at that stage, I was like, there's not a bigger story I can find to give myself to than this yeah. God who's renewing and restoring literally every mm-hmm square inch of creation. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, went to seminary 
And um, at the time, I don't know if this is <laughs> all true for you. It surely is true for some of the listeners. Okay. I have to imagine I'm not the uh-huh. only one uh-huh. uh, who was caught up in this. But you know what? Uh, because I spent most of high school and college uh, kind of effectively not a practicing Christian, most of my mm-hmm. friends were not Christians. And so mm-hmm. having gone through this kind of, in a sense, reawakening personally, um, I really had a deep ache to try and embody and communicate mm-hmm. the Christian story to my friends who are not of any kind yeah. of particular faith. Yeah. And, uh, and so the, the folks that were making the most space for that conversation and were most interested, actually, mm-hmm. this was about 20 years ago now, um, was really caught up in the seeker sensitive movement and some of the mm-hmm. uh, laggards of that. And the thing that was so, so beautiful about that movement was there's lots of, uh, shots that one can take and um, maybe mal effects of the seeker sensitive church movement as well. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. at its core, I think it was a movement of hospitality for people who would not usually be a part of the church. And that was really attractive to me. And so I went out to seminary very much within that world and imagination and knowing some of those yeah. people. And yeah. that's where I'm like, I can't be the only one yeah. who went to seminary Um yeah. In that era thinking, yeah, I mean, the best way to help grow a church is to be a really, pe- you know, incredible yep. speaker and get people to come to this yep. church service. And same here. You know, <laughs> that right. I mean, yeah. see, I'm not alone. Yeah. You're not alone. Um, uh, 100% not. <laughs> um, and then what happened is, um, I, and I write about this a little bit in Every Look, Mm -hmm. You know, and this is true, again, for lots of listeners have very, very different stories, but one common theme might be, hmm, it's one thing to get people to go to church Mm -hmm. or create a space of hospitality Mm -hmm. or relevance for them. But um, that's just an hour and a half or maybe two hours on a given week. Like, how in the world can we be the church and how do we um, cultivate leadership in the everyday life of our neighborhoods and how do we join in God's big holistic Michigan, um, Michigan mission <laughs> that has to do with everything in Michigan yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that ended up becoming a whole different question. And I, at one point was in a gathering of primarily church leaders and uh, someone who you, uh, again, some of your listeners might know Michael Frost, who is an Australian mm-hmm. missiologist and speaker yeah. I've had um, him on the podcast. Yeah. So hopefully. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's just yeah. become a dear friend. But at the time, you know, he was, uh, you know, back in the day, he happens to have the gifts and skills to be a mm. rock star, mm-hmm. mega church pastor. Mm-hmm. He really does. And um, I'll never forget. He was telling the story about starting this new faith community in Sydney where he's still at. And uh, he and his team had decided that he actually wouldn't preach. He wouldn't speak. Hmm. For wow. the first couple, I think year, they had basically discerned he was going to be a leadership team, but he wasn't going to ever speak. Um, and the reason for that is that he was already somewhat well known in Australia, and he knew that he could draw a crowd. But effectively, that was not the mission of the church. That that wasn't the game they were playing. And that metaphor yeah. of you know we're playing a different game, we're trying to do yeah. something else. The the yeah. point of our church is not actually get to get people to come to church. It's to mm-hmm. join in what God are doing yep. in our neighborhood. Well, when I heard that, I, I nearly fell off my chair and yeah. um, it was a pivotal moment. And in some ways uh, that was the beginning of the parish collective. In fact, that's mm. actually at that gathering is where I met Paul Sparks, who's a dear friend and co-founder of the parish collective. And uh, we had some, a lot of similar longings, albeit, starting from different places yeah. and that quest of how do we be the church in our yeah. everyday lives, in our neighborhoods is still the question I am yeah. asking all the time. Yeah. So, so you started the parish collective then. Um, and I've, I've attended some of the parish collective events, uh, gathering, uh, was a cultivate gathering here in San Diego a couple of times. Looking forward to being there again in uh, February, I think. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about. Uh, I mean, you've started to tell us, but the you know the mission of Parish Collective. What are you trying? Like, what's the goal? What what when you achieve, so to speak, uh, what you're 
what you're called to as parish collective, what, what happens? What do you, what do we see happening? Does that make sense? Yeah. What you see happening both at the neighborhood level and then across neighborhoods, kind of at the city level are more and more congregations, churches, groups who are primarily asking that question of what has God up to and Mm -hmm. how do I join in it? And what are the practices and postures and prompts that we need to keep asking ourselves in order to join in what God's doing? Yeah. Not to be the savers of the world or think that we're we can save our neighborhoods, but taking our vibrant faith and saying we actually mm-hmm. do believe that God is renewing and restoring everything. Yeah. And our task is to join that work where God is the primary agent, you could say, and mm-hmm. we're the supporting cast. Yeah. And um practically what that could look like is more and more and more stories and experiences and relationships where you're hearing about small and large groups of people who are focused on that question Mm -hmm. and allowing for their congregational, their ecclesial life to be formed by that question. Mm. Um, And you can imagine as a network, then the more people and groups and leaders that are asking that question and wrestling with it and experimenting with it, they're going to probably want to talk to other friends who are in very different places and very different cities and contexts mm-hmm. and cultures asking that same question and, and learning from each other, celebrating each other, praying for each other, yeah. uh, wrestling through big, you know, cultural questions and even, even uh, difficult theological things that are contextual yeah. and learning from each other as peers who are trying to join what God's up to. That's great. That's great. I love that. Um, and so, um, uh, so I, I like to talk about, you know, what, what is the church for? What is the mission of the church? And, and one of the things that you say in the book is that you taught your t- kids never to say, uh, go to church, you, to use that phrase, go to church. So maybe thinking about that and also thinking about, um, the mission of the church. Like if you were to help a, a church understand, okay, here's what your mission is. Here's what our mission is. How would you, how would you uh, describe that? What would you say? Yeah, I, um, I've got a 12 year old son and then two other younger boys, six and two. And I happened to, um, many years ago, get a degree in rhetoric Mm. (laughs) from the university of Wisconsin, which Mm. is, uh, basically you can sum up that whole field by saying that words create worlds, which is something that I still believe. And so given what you've heard of my story, since yep. I'm trying to get my life effectively for the capital C church, mm-hmm. that word matters a lot to me. Mm-hmm. And I've always thought it's so crazy that we even say that we're going to church because yeah. no, nobody actually, uh, it's like saying that you're going to purple or, <laughs> or going to baseball or something, you know, like uh-huh. you, know, you can't, that's, it, it's ontologically impossible actually. So it's yeah. just, it's bad grammar. It's bad theology. It's bad missiology. Hmm. So I didn't want my little kids growing up that even saying we're going to church, even though I, of course I understand sure. what they mean is like, are we going to the service or the liturgy right. or right. whatever. Right. Right. Um, but it's a funny phrase. And yeah. so I actually think that that phrase can actually over time erode your question of what is mm-hmm. the church for? And I think this is one of the most important questions of our day. Mm -hmm. And how I would answer it is that the church exists to join in the hopes and dreams of God right there Mm -hmm. in our everyday lives, in our neighborhoods. And if that is the kind of big why or the driving purpose of the church, Mm -hmm. I feel like that's pretty compelling for our neighbors, actually. Now, I want to ask, you say, join in the hopes and dreams of God for neighborhood. What are the hopes and dreams of God for our neighborhood? Well, it requires a whole lot of listening, right? Mm -hmm. Um, For those hopes and dreams to become particular. Mm -hmm. I think that most of us could say there's lots and lots of hopes and dreams that we can pretty well intuit through scripture, Mm -hmm. church history, intellect, et cetera. Mm -hmm. For example, um, God is a God of healing. And so God doesn't want destruction of any kind, violence of any kind, the the breakdown or the harm of relationships. And so does God want healthy 
marriages and friendships, of course. So I think that's yeah. part of the hope and dream of God. Yeah. But that you can imagine, let's just take marriages. Does God want healthy, whole, equitable, vibrant marriages? Yeah, I think that God does. Hmm. Um, I think that because of scripture, I think that because of reason, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Now, it's one thing to just say God cares about marriages, which I think is pretty demonstrably true, or at least you could take on faith. Mm-hmm. That's a very different question than walking around their block, knowing that some friends are on the brink of divorce. And then asking the question, what is mine to do here, God? Those are mm-hmm. two different pathways. One is per- very particular yeah, and complex mm-hmm. and relational and prompts, frankly, even more discernment. Maybe it's just prayer. Maybe it's an invitation. Maybe it's, who knows what it is. Sure. But if you know that God cares about marriages and you know that you've got friends on the block who are not in a good spot and they need help, well, that is an invitation. It's a holy invitation. Mm-hmm. And that's just one tiny example, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there are... There are kids who are profoundly ignored and neglected by their parents yeah. if they have any. There right. are there are neighbors who have been marginalized because of their race or ethnicity. There are um, entrepreneurs who have almost no chance of getting access to capital for mm-hmm. their brilliant idea also because they don't happen to have rich aunts and uncles. I mean, on and on. You can imagine when you just walk around your neighborhood and you begin to say, God, what are you up to? I think you'll be flooded with ideas and even God-sized longings. But the thing about it at the neighborhood level or the parish level, we love that word parish because, Hmm. um, well, first of all, it has kind of a religious uh, history. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes when people hear me or many colleagues talk about the parish or neighborhood, they're they're kind of synonymous, Mm -hmm. neighborhood and parish. Mm -hmm. And certainly lots of folks that we work with are in cities. And so, mm-hmm. you know, neighborhoods and cities have a yeah. pretty direct relationship usually, mm-hmm. but parish is a fun word because, you know, if you're living in a suburb or ministering in a suburb, that whole suburb probably is a parish. You might not right. call it a neighborhood, uh-huh. but it probably is a parish if you go with our definition, which is a, a geographic area that is large enough to live a lot of your life, to mm-hmm. live, work, play, mm-hmm. but small enough to be known as a Mm. character in the story of that place. And so most suburbs effectively are are parish. Sometimes they could break down in a couple neighborhoods, but for the most part, when you think of the broader ecology of a place, like a suburb, it's probably a parish. And then rural areas, that might be 50, 60, 100 square miles with a common center. And so place itself, like breaking it down and wrestling through, thinking through, yeah, what is our geographic area that we're seeking to discern what God is up to. We're seeking discernment as to how to participate. We're seeking to just name and identify and champion the beautiful things that are already here that we love. Um, All those invitations come when we get more particular. That's great. And all of those things are kept at bay Mm -hmm. if we're only kind of regional or we don't have the, in some ways, courage to make our our, our, our faith and our life of faith more particular. Um, Kind of a technical question or logistical question. Um, If a church or pastor said, how do I determine what my parish is? What kind of guidance would you give them? Oh, fantastic question. Well, um, in most, if you're in a city, a kind of city proper, not like inner and second and third ring suburbs, but if you're in a city proper, you probably have a decent sense of it. Not all cities do. And even the idea of how many neighborhoods are there and what's their name can be disputed. Um, but I would I would begin to think through what might be some of the centers of activity, mm-hmm. whether that be businesses or libraries, parks, or center. Where do people congregate? Where do they hang out? Yep. And where potentially might be there be some edges? That yep. could be a highway, it could be rivers, it could be... Uh, main boulevard or street is usually how cities begin to break down. Um, and then maybe most importantly is do residents and, and like other organizations, but primarily residents, do they affiliate with that place? Mm-hmm. Sometimes developers just like try and create a neighborhood that no one, mm. <laughs> it's not actually real. Right. Um, or they're trying to make it real. Right. Um, 
but in a city, that's probably the best idea. And then, like I said, in suburbs and rural areas, I feel like uh, because of the the history of how suburban communities were built and designed, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which was not actually for um, people walking and talking, it was primarily built for the automobile. That's actually pretty much indisputable they're probably going to have to think about a little bit of a larger geographic area. Right. Um, and so things to be looking for could be like high schools or mm-hmm. schools, how many schools or school districts mm-hmm. encompass here. Mm-hmm. Um, and could you still be known? Does mm-hmm. the, does the area have a, a mayor or city council? Is there an association of some sort that we could be yeah. a part of? Um, and then again, in rural areas, Typically, it's pretty well known where the centers are, and then it's more the edges that can be confusing. But honestly, I think those edges can be relatively blurry. The hard yeah. edges of rural areas <laughs> matter less and less when you're looking at much more mm, yeah. um, pastoral, agricultural land. Yeah, yeah. That's helpful. That's very helpful. I'm thinking about uh, my own church. Um in San Diego here. Uh, it's in La Jolla, Mount Soledad, which is very wealthy area, lots of homes behind gates, but our, the people in our congregation don't live there. It's, um, they live down the hill because that's where they can afford to live, <laughs> but they love being a part of this church. So anyway, it's an interesting sort of conundrum. Um, and, and I'm, so I'm thinking even about myself, our parish might include Pacific Beach and Claremont and University City, which is just down the hill. That's where our people live. And a couple of folks live on the hill, you know. Um, but also think, I mean, I think we're there for a reason. Um, you know, I've been in churches where needs are clear for your neighborhood. The last church I was at had a fantastic food pantry ministry because there was a 16 to 20% food insecurity rate in that town. And so they became a I mean, that became their ministry to the neighbors. And it what, what I love about it is that um, the lady who leads that said, the people, we don't just serve our people, they're becoming our friends, you know? And so, and some of them come and serve with us, you know, um, and then are able, you know, and then also take some food home. But anyway, but it's it was almost very clear. It's a tiny town. This is our parish. And then some places are more like where I'm at now, which is like, here's where we're located. And our people are kind of all around here. And, um, and there may be some lines, but anyway, I, I say all that just to say, I think it's worth the effort to try to determine, okay, what is our parish and who are we called to love and serve? Um, and what are the unique needs, which is also in a wealthier area is harder to determine, I think. Um, yeah. So we're working on that. (laughs) I would say this, Marcus, um, and this is a pretty common question when I'm out speaking or facilitating Mm -hmm trainings like we do with learning communities around the country um, is absolutely your kind of great opportunity to discern where the parishes are. And certainly Mm -hmm. at Mount Soledad and La Jolla, that's a big part of it. Yeah. What is true for a whole host of congregations, I would say the majority in this country for Mm -hmm. a whole host of good reasons, not least, like you said, economic and Mm -hmm. real estate prices and mobility is that, um, there are actually in a lot of congregations, there are usually two, three, four, sometimes seven or eight um, parishes from a built environment perspective mm-hmm. that then are a part of the congregation. And as a result, sometimes there's some really beautiful experiments and invitations for those folks who are already embedded there to be asking the question, you know, what does it mean for us to join in the work of God and um, make disciples and be formed in the image of Jesus and build community here in our everyday lives. Yeah. Yeah. A- and as we worship, um, Amon Soledad, we're doing that with our brothers and sisters who are asking the same question, but in a couple different mm. places. Mm. And so in that sense, there are lots of congregations. I'm actually headed out to Richmond soon, a fantastic uh-huh. congregation that has intentionally built itself at, as a collection of parishes, Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And so in that sense, it's kind of like the parish collective mission nationally mm. within a much smaller region. Interesting. And um, what can be really fun there is to see uh-huh. small teams mm-hmm. who are beginning to ask questions and do some experiments, still yeah. absolutely coming on Sundays. But yeah. what's really fun is a lot of times 
the stories and the yearning for more prayer and the vibrancy of worship and yeah. the needing truly to be attuned to the work of the spirit mm -hmm. is heightened pretty dramatically when you start to ask those questions. Yeah. And yeah. it's pretty amazing to be able to worship alongside brothers and sisters who are asking similar kinds of questions, mm -hmm. even if it's the next neighborhood or two or three over, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of yeah. adaptive and innovative, um, opportunities that come when people are asking yeah. a common question in different places. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. And you talked, you mentioned as you're talking about this, I think the role of experimenting, innovating, um, is I would love for you to talk about that. Like, cause, um, sometimes we, we say, okay, let's figure out in advance what's going to work <laughs> and then we do it and then it doesn't. And then we feel uh, all bummed out about that, but talk about experimenting. Maybe how, how does that fit into discerning our parishes and loving our parishes? Yeah, I think this is a huge opportunity. Um, I am of the belief, at least right now, that one of the most faithful steps that anyone can take if they're interested in joining God's huge, big, glorious mission at the neighborhood mm -hmm. level hmm. is to do so experimentally. Mm -hmm. um, I think that huge year and three and five year congregational strategic plans yeah. um, can be pretty difficult to pull off um, and often set up a lot of expectations, which can be difficult. Mm -hmm. Whereas a three month experiment that we are literally just trying to learn from often creates insights that we can then build on. I, um, it's not a church book at all, but there's a fantastic uh, book that was formative for me called the lean startup by mm -hmm. Eric Reese. And in it, he says essentially that most startups, and he's mostly talking about like tech startups, you know, Silicon Valley yeah. startups, that they fail not because the idea was wrong or that they didn't have capital. It's that they were partially right. And then they ran out of money before they could make the pivot they needed to hmm. having learned what they learned. So for hmm. example, they maybe launched an app thinking we're going to um, connect dog walkers and people that need dog walking. Right. Yeah. I'm just making this up. Sure. And sure. as it, at, what they found out by launching it is that's not exactly the thing that's needed. What's actually needed mm. is, is this people actually need whatever, uh, yeah. someone to hold their mail. That's a ridiculous yeah. example, but you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. when they, when they <clears throat> launched it, they found out that they are partially right. I think this is, mm. so what, what Eric Ries says, what you have to start with is a minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. And then the task is to learn from it. Now let's put that in, leadership and ecclesial kind of church terms. I think that the invitation could be towards minimum Bible presence. So we just try some things we mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. um, that might be literally walking around your neighborhood with much more of a open prayerful imagination, even better with a couple of friends. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's deciding for just three months, you're going to show up at the neighborhood association meeting. You don't have yeah. to say anything. You don't have to do anything. You're yep. literally just going to show up and then see how it goes. Um, or maybe it's you're going to hang out at a particular cafe and listen, or maybe you're going to get involved with a local nonprofit, or you can on and on. It's yeah. endless what you could do, but yeah. you don't have to say, I'm going to start this whole new ministry or this new nonprofit or this, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, we're going to break ground in this whole new right. complex. That may come. Yeah. But initially, I just start really small, really yeah. simple. And see if you can learn from it and then tell those stories and maybe nothing works and yeah. you kind of fall on your face. Well, then it was three months. You didn't commit to it for three years. That's right. And, and you've learned something, right? Big time. Yeah. And then Big you time. take that. And you take it and you, and you keep growing. And ideally, and this is where it's so powerful, just where, you know, two or three or more are gathered. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you're not doing it on your own. You're like, Hey, how about we do this? You know? Let's just hang out at this cafe, you know, yeah. on Wednesday mornings. I yeah. used to go to this cafe. I used to go to this. You, you used to go here. Let's hang out here. Let's work together on mm. uh, Wednesdays and just see what happens yeah. and see yeah. who we meet and see, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it'll be fun. 
and maybe it won't. And then we again, the commitment is maybe it's a month, right. maybe right. it's two weeks in a row. Um, I think that um, is usually pretty good advice. And then I would say this: I think there's a lot of pastors listening, uh-huh. encouraging those experiments, mm-hmm. and then kind of bragging about them again, mm. regardless of the effect or the outcome just for the courage to try yeah i think that's a big thing that frankly the broader landscape of north Mm. american christianity is longing for just yeah try some things it does not have to be big and bold yeah it can be very small and faithful and maybe you skin your mini maybe amazing things happen but i think a big part of the pastoral task is to be listening for those stories and then celebrating them both from the pulpit but also just making the connections with other people that might want to join or praying for people. Like, I'll, you know, yeah. you're going to show up to the neighborhood association meeting. I'll, I'll be praying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. And, um, yeah, I, I love the freedom of, uh, being able to try something without the fear of failure, you know, cause we're not, uh, necessarily trying to succeed at something. I mean, I guess broadly we're, we're trying to succeed at accomplishing God's mission, of healing and wholeness for our neighborhood, you know? Um, but this particular way in which we're trying, you know, in which we think maybe, maybe this will work, right? We, if it doesn't, oh, great. Now we know that that doesn't work and, or that's not our calling or that's not how we're wired to, uh, to partner with God in our neighborhood. And then you try something else, you know, maybe that works or doesn't, then you try something else. And eventually, right. I think that we find, ah, here, here's the thing. Uh, here's the thing that works. Um, so yeah, anyway, like, I thank love you. This. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. Um, um, maybe one last, uh, just kind of broad question for anyone who, uh, is thinking, all right, I want to, I want, you know, I want to get into our neighborhood. I want to help my people understand or, or, or just kind of lead them into, into our neighborhoods, whatever that looks like, but maybe just briefly, uh, a word of encouragement or a word of, um, guidance or something where do i start you know what would you say i would start by writing down a handful of questions that are unique to you that you're actually interested in whether it be what Mm. god's up to or who else is there or some of the history perhaps of where you live or work Mm -hmm. um to to start with curiosity a sacred curiosity Mm. as my friend Jose humphreys talks about and and then try some experiments Mm-hmm. ideally with a friend or two, or even mm-hmm. maybe a, a spouse, a partner, um, to say, Hey, can we, can, I, I'm interested in this. Would you, would you go on this kind of very little journey with me? Yeah. I think that's the place to begin that's um, great. and to be praying the whole time. That's awesome. Uh, what, what a great, simple way to start. I love it. Um, Tim, if uh, people wanted to find out more about you and the work that you're doing, Parish Collective and whatever else there might be, um, where could they go? Sure. Um, well, parishclub.org is the website and folks can um, sign up and get newsletters, which is primarily stories from people that are doing this all over the country. So mm. if you're like, who else is doing this? And what, I, I could need some prompting or some inspiration. Sign up for that email. And there are yeah. stories from all over the country of incredible yeah. ordinary heroes and pastoral leaders who are doing big and small things all over the country. Um and then uh, we have a handful of, as you mentioned earlier, there's a regional gathering coming up in San Diego for those mm-hmm. who are in Southern California called Cultivate. The Inhabit Conference is our longer event that'll be in Seattle in April. And honestly, reach out to us. Um, if you're like, oh, I want to meet more people, let us mm-hmm. know because we're always trying to figure out how we can connect more people who want to go on something of a similar journey, regardless of their yeah. Christian tradition. That's great. That's great. Good. Well, I will hopefully see you at Cultivate in February if you're there. So that'll be fun. Yep. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, uh, Tim, thank you. Uh, this is great. Thanks for the work that you're doing. And uh, just thanks for being here today. Thank you, Marcus. It was a joy to be here.